Hey, it's Horner. We're going to look at two sections. This time we're going to look at section 10.3, which is kinetic energy, and section 10.4, which is potential energy, because they typically transfer energy from one to the other. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So if something is moving, it's got kinetic energy, and it can either be moving in a straight line, which means it's translating from place to place, or it's rotating, so it's spinning in a circle. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about the rotational part this time. We'll do that when we do uh, rotational motion. And so the equation that you see down on the bottom here, we're not going to worry about this part yet, so we'll just cross it off. But we are going to deal with the translational motion. So kinetic energy of an object is one half of its mass times its velocity squared, or its speed squared. And let's go ahead and do a little quick check just to make sure we understand this. Ball A, so we've got two balls, uh, has half the mass and eight times the kinetic energy ball B. They want to know what's the ratio of the speeds. So let's start this one by setting up an equation. Ka is equal to, so the kinetic energy of A is equal to one half of the mass of A times the speed of A squared. And if we're going to do a ratio, here, let's back that off for just a second. If we're going to do a ratio, we can just say this is KB. And then here we've got one half of the mass of B times VB squared. Uh, things that are the same that cross off are the halves. And now I can go through and put in the numbers that they gave us up here. So ball A has one half of the mass of ball B. And it has eight times the kinetic energy. So we've got really 8Ka over Kb uh, is equal to 1 half Ma over Mb times Va squared over Vb squared. And because we're looking for this relationship here, this ratio, um, we're going to go ahead and get rid of the Ka, the Kb, the Ma, and the Mb. So we're going to do 8 is equal to 1 half times the quantity Va squared over Vb squared. And now I'm going to divide both sides by a half. So this would be 8 divided by 1 half is equal to VA squared over VB squared. And 8 divided by a half is actually 16. So that's equal to VA squared over VB squared. Now some people might say, oh, the answer is 16. But no, watch out. We have to do the square root of both sides because that want they want VA over VB, not VA squared over VB squared. And if you do that, you'll find out that your answer should be four. And so that's our answer to number four for that, uh, that one. Now, for rotational kinetic energy, uh, we said we weren't going to talk about it much, so we're just going to look at it for a second. Rotational kinetic energy, the moment of inertia. So all that is is the, uh, oh, it, inertia, remember, is uh, anything that's moving has inertia. Well, this has an inertia and a circle, and instead of calling that just regular inertia, we call that the moment of inertia. Um, and remember, angular velocity was this funny looking butt thing here. And so uh, really all we need to do is uh, just know that when it rotates, it does have some rotational kinetic energy. So let's take a look at example 10.5. This is a speed of a bobsled after pushing. So we have a two-man bobsled. Uh, has a mass of 390 kilograms. It starts from rest. The two racers push it, the sled for the first 50 meters with a net force of 270. Neglecting friction, what is the, speeds, uh, the sled's speed at the end of that 50 meters? So here's a good picture of before and a good picture after. Um, we know that uh, we've, it says we can find the, fi the sled's final kinetic energy and hence its speed. So uh, by finding the work done on the racers as they push on the sled. So we know the certain quantities here. We know the original speed is zero. We know the mass is 390. We know the distance that they travel is 50 meters. We know the force is 270 and we know our original speed as we said before is zero. Um, so we're just increasing the kinetic energy as we go. Kinetic energy, uh, if I look at the work energy equation, okay, we know that work is equal to the change in energy. And because we only have kinetic energy here, it's just the kinetic final minus kinetic original or kinetic initial is what they've put here. So the sled's final kinetic energy should be equal to, if I rearrange this equation, I end up with this one. 
So I've just moved the Ki to the other side. And now I can plug in my kinetic energy equation, 1F mv. Notice this is final speed of the system. This is original speed of the system. And then work is force times distance. Uh, because uh, the original speed is zero, this whole term goes away. And now I'm left with this equation, 1 half mv final squared is equal to the force times the distance. If I solve this for vf, I can either do that or plug all my numbers in. I'm going to solve for vf. So vf here is equal to, notice I need to multiply both sides by uh, 2. So this is going to be 2 times f times d. And then I have to divide by m. And then because this is squared, I want to do the square root. And that's the equation that we have here. So to find the speed, we just plug everything in. It's be 2 times 270 times 50. And then we take that whole thing divided by 390. And we end up with 8.3 meters per second. And that would be the final speed. Here's a good quick check. Uh, this quick check, I have a light plastic cart. There it is, and a heavy steel cart. They're bo both pushed uh, with the same force for a distance of one meter, starting from rest. After the force is removed, the kinetic energy, the light plastic cart is blank. Is it greater than, equal to, less than, can't say, it depends on how big the force is, than that of the steel cart? And your answer here is it is equal to. And it's equal because I'm using the same force I'm going the same distance, so I have the same amount of work is done. So I'm going to have the same change in kinetic energy. The only deal that's going to happen here is one of them's going to be moving a lot faster than the other one uh, as it goes through. And so we'll look at that in a different example. We have a lot of different boxes here. We have A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, they're all pulled for 10 meters across the level frictionless floor. Which box experiences the greatest change in kinetic energy? So really here, we just want to look at the work. We, want to, we know that they all are starting at zero. And uh, we just want to do force times distance. Okay, um, And we want to know which one has the biggest change in kinetic energy. So which one do we do the most work on? Because that's equal to work. And this is equal to the change in kinetic energy. So um, let's, uh, let's go through and just kind of take a look and see what the correct answer is. Then we'll go through and calculate it. Our work energy equation, they all have the same distance. Whoops. <laughs> so the largest work and the largest change in kinetic energy corresponds to the largest force. So the one with the largest force here has got to be the 20 newtons. Has got to be the 20 newtons. All right, so let's go on and take a look at the next one. This one says each of the one kilogram boxes starts at rest and is pulled two meters across the level frictionless floor by a rope with the noted force at the angle. Which box has the highest final speed? So in other words, which one has the biggest change in kinetic energy, which is the biggest amount of work done on it? So uh, what we've got to be careful of is look out for the angles. We know that the direction of motion is in this direction. So for each one of these, we need to do the force okay, times the cosine of the angle. If you do the force times the cosine of the angle for each one of these, what you'll notice is the one that gives you the biggest number will be the 20 times the cosine of 30. Um, the 45 degree angle is going to give you an even smaller number than what's here, than what you see here. So our biggest one has got to be letter B. Uh, for potential energy, potential energy is obviously different. This is stored energy, uh, and it can be converted into all kinds of other forms of energy, such as kinetic or thermal. We say that forces that can store useful energy are called conservative forces. So gravity and elastic forces, when you stretch a rubber band, that's storing energy. When you lift something up, uh, you're storing energy. Because when you let go of those two things, then they return back to their original positions. Uh, friction, which can't store any energy, is a non-conservative force. So a couple of different types of forces that we have to worry about when we're going through this section. Um, the gravitational potential energy here is really just anytime you lift anything or anytime you take anything from a higher height down to a lower height, you have changed the gravitational potential. 
So the change in gravitational potential is proportional to the change in height. So we're really looking at this right here. You also have to have an object that has mass. And that's because in our equation, potential energy due to gravity, so we call this U, G, is equal to M times G times the height of the object, which is Y. Okay? Um, and depending on where we choose our reference level, uh, we can really change what the, can, what the potential energy is. So for most cases, we're going to start with potential energy, the height, okay, so this is height 0, or y is equal to 0. y is equal to 0 down at the bottom. And then these would be y is equal to 100 and y is equal to 200. Um, we want to choose this reference level, and that helps us a little bit. Uh, because gravity is conservative, gravitational energy depends not only on the height, and not only on, uh, depends just only on that height, sorry. It does not depend on the path. So if I am a hiker and I take path A and I go up to a ledge and then I go up to the top of the hill, I have the same amount of potential energy as somebody who starts and climbs the side of the hill instead of taking this longer path. So the path does not matter. So not on the path, only on the change in height. So when you look for uh, that change in height, why, make sure that you're not counting the actual path that it's going on as long as there's no friction. If there's friction, then you do. Um, quick check. It says rank and order from largest to smallest, the gravitational potential energy of the balls. Uh, notice this one has uh, is at the ground height, so we're going to say that this is h equal to 0, and then this is h is equal to a max, or you can use the letter y if you want to. Don't worry about the speeds. Uh, this one has speed, this one has speed in a direction, this one does too, and so does this one. They want us just to find out the gravitational potential energies. So it looks like 1 is going to have the least amount of energy, and 3 is going to have the most. So 1 has the least, 3 has the most. So we know that A and B can't be correct. The question is, is two, are 2 and 4 equal? Well, they're both at the same height. So they're both at the same Y or change in height here. So that's what we'll do. And because they're both at the same height, we're going to say that they're going to have to be equal. And so our answer here is letter D. That's quick check 10.13, 10.1.4, uh, starting from rest, a marble rolls down a steeper hill, then down a less steep hill of the same height. For which is it going faster at the bottom? And uh, what we're doing here is we're taking gravitational potential energy and we're converting it into kinetic energy. If they both have the same height, they both are going to have the same potential energy. And if they both have the potential energy at the top, they should both have the same kinetic energy at the bottom. And so they should have the same speed at the bottom of both of the hills. Okay? And that's ignoring rotational motion and friction. For 10.15, this one says a smile child slides down four different slides. They want to know what is her speed at the bottom. And since we keep saying that height is the only thing that matters and not the path, then we're going to say that the speed should be the same for her at the bottom, regardless of which slide she slides on. Elastic potential energy is our next type of potential energy. And this is uh, elastic or spring potential energy. And this is the energy we get when we compress a spring or if you pull a spring out, okay, or extend a spring. So if I push the spring in, here's my change in position, here's my force, and Hooke's law is the law that describes that force that's required to compress that spring. So if we go to the next equation here, you'll notice that it's changed a little bit. Potential energy of a spring is equal to 1 half times k times x squared. This is a lot like kinetic energy, one half of mass times velocity squared, but they only look the same. There's nothing else that's the same about those two. Uh, so that is the elastic potential energy of a spring in the equation for it. This is quick check 10.16. I have three balls that are thrown off a cliff with the same speed, but at very different angles. Which ball has the greatest speed before it hits the ground? Well, notice they're all starting at the same height. Okay, They're all starting at the same height. So because they all start at the same height, they will all have the same speed because we're really just worried about 
what is this change in y? Okay, so what is the change in our position here, or change in height, which is y is kind of what we had done before. So we'll keep that change in height, which is equal to y. Um, I realize this one goes up, but if you think about it, the speed here and the speed here are the same. Uh, this one, even though it's kicked out, will go a little bit further, but its speed will be the same here, and this one's the same. We also did this in, uh, when we did projectile motion, so you can do them either way, but it's a lot easier to say they have the same speed because of potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. So the potential energy due to gravity at the top should be equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom, and that should be equal to each other. That's 10.16. 10.17, I have a hockey puck sliding up smooth ice at 4 meters per second until it comes to a 1 meter high hill. Will it make it to the top of the hill? And so for this one, we've got to figure out, um, uh, we know that the potential energy here is zero because it's down at the bottom. And we know the potential energy here is something that we don't know yet. The kinetic energy of this is equal to one half of the mass, and so if we say the mass is one, then we could do v squared, um, and so our v here is actually four, so this would be four squared. The kinetic energy at the bottom should be equal to the potential energy due to gravity at the top. So let's think about the equation. One half mv squared should be equal to m gh. If you notice, the masses don't matter, and so we don't have to worry about that, so the answer cannot be this one. Now let's find out if we can make it up the height. Um, we're going to do 1 half of 4 squared is 16, and that's equal to 10 times the height. So 16 divided by 2 is 8, and that's uh, equal to 10 times the height. So the height you can go here is about 0.8 meters. So no, you cannot make it up that hill. And that would be the correct answer. Uh, next thing that we can do is look at uh, this, uh, uh, this problem. An archer pulls back a string on her bow to a distance of 70 centimeters from equilibrium. To hold the string at the position takes a force of 140 newtons. How much elastic potential energy is there? So if you remember Hooke's law, we said the force of a spring is equal to negative kx, uh, where x is the distance that we have to pull it back. Uh, and we need to find the spring constant, k. So let's go ahead and move on to the next part of this problem. And to find that spring constant, k, we just rearranged our equation for force of a spring. And we said that's equal to kx. So we just divided both sides by x. And we find out that the k is now 900 newtons per meter. Elastic potential energy is 1 half times k times that same uh, stretch squared. So we have 1 half of, that's where we put this number in, times 0.7 squared. And we end up with 49 joules. So it takes about 49 joules of kinetic energy for a fast-moving arrow. Uh, that seems pretty reasonable for what they're doing. And that is the end of example 10.8, and that is the end of this section. We will not be doing thermal energy. We're going to go on to section 10.6 next.